Good morning, everyone. Before the sermon starts, I just kind of want to talk to you guys about some things. If uh, Many of you may have been well aware that we've actually been recording our sermons for the past three years. So it's been a long time since we've been doing this, and even before the coronavirus, we were recording it. When the coronavirus hit, we started live streaming a little more, uh, and then once churches got kind of shut down and uh, temporarily, we started premiering videos, so that way you could pre-record them, then upload them, uh, and that worked out pretty well. So the question becomes, what about now? Uh, what are we going to do now that the church is open? Are we still going to keep live streaming or premiering or uploading, stuff like that? Well, the answer is yes, kind of, <laughs> right? Because we're not necessarily going to premiere the videos because we're, we're just going to live stream. Premiering, again, is pre-recording it, then uploading it. Uh, and this particular video is pre-recorded, but I'm just going to play it during the worship service this morning. Uh, so it is true we are going to continue live streaming because a lot of people, they're still staying home and they still want to watch the service and you guys can still watch it same time. Uh, but then the question becomes, what about the music? If you watch our videos like three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, before all this coronavirus started happening, you'll start to realize that we didn't record the music. And so why didn't we record the music? Well, there's several reasons why we didn't record the music. First, copyright issues. You can't just uh, put a song on YouTube and that's not yours, right? So there's copyright issues there. And then secondly, it didn't sound very good. Uh, so what we tweak out here to make it sound good in here is also tweaking it on the recording. So once we tweak it out here to make it sound good out here, it doesn't always sound very good on the recording. And this has always been true for us. And I remember worship leaders in the past, they were like, we don't want you guys to record the music. It doesn't sound very good. Not that it doesn't sound good out here. It sounds great out here but it doesn't always sound very good in the recording, and it was a little, uh, a little strange for them. So they're like, don't worry about recording the music, just upload the sermons, and just record the sermons, stuff like that. So there was at least two reasons why we didn't uh, record the sermons in the past, was because of copyright issues and because it didn't even sound very good. So why have we been kind of doing it recently? Well, we have been buying our music through things like Worship House Media, and they say that, you know, you guys have the rights to... Uh, once you buy this, you buy the rights to play it on a live stream, and that's awesome. But one of the issues is they said, but we don't have all the songs ready for you guys to live stream. So we have the rights for some of the songs to live stream, but not all of them. So that becomes kind of confusing for someone like me, who is the one live streaming everything, because I don't know which songs can be live streamed and which songs can't be live streamed. So it, it keeps getting kind of confusing, and we don't know which songs to play. And before we opened back up the church where we're going to be live streaming again, we were premiering videos. So what we would do is we'd get people like Mark and uh, his sons and they'd come over here and they'd sing a song and that was great, they sounded great. And once I edited all those things, what I could do is I could actually upload it early on a private upload and then if Facebook or YouTube sent me a message back saying, no, you can't use this song, then I would know that I couldn't use that song. And that happened at least once or twice uh, to where I knew that I couldn't use that song because Facebook and YouTube knocked it off. So then the question became, uh, if, I, if they told me I couldn't use it, then I would just cut it and I'd use a different song. But now that we're live streaming again, I don't have that luxury of uploading it first to see if it's okay and then playing it uh, during the live stream. So it's a little confusing. So for right now, I talked to the senior pastor, at least for this week, we're not going to live stream the worship service. So during the music, we're just going to play this kind of a video, an introductory video. That way you guys have something to watch and it's going to talk about a little bit of a brief lesson while you guys wait for the worship service to end so that the sermon can start. And this video may be cut off abruptly so that the sermon can start because it's kind of confusing on how long is the music going to continue and when the music stops and the sermon starts, this video may still be playing, so we may cut it off, or this video may not be playing, so we'll just have a timer or something to let you know when the video is going to start. So the point is, uh, today we're going to talk about a little bit of an introductory lesson, not necessarily an introductory into what the senior pastor is going to be preaching about, but just something to kind of uh, whet your appetite, I guess. So today we're going to talk about Ravi Zacharias and who he was, because many of you guys know Ravi Zacharias passed away uh, sometime this week, unfortunately, and he was just such a great guy. Uh, I didn't know him personally, but I've, I've heard many of his lessons. I remember I would listen to, with Jim, we would be working together, we'd be working in construction or something, and then we would be listening to Ravi Zacharias on YouTube or on the radio or something like that, and he was just such an inspi inspiring person. And Billy, Billy Graham was often known as the great evangelist of his day, but then Ravi Zacharias was known as the great apologist of his day. So what's the difference between an apologist and an evangelist? 
Well, if I had to describe a very simple way of showing you the difference, I'd say that an evangelist goes for the heart, right? They're trying to get you at the heart, whereas an apologist is trying to explain it to you using the head. So those are the differences between an apologist and an evangelist. One looks for your heart, the other one looks for your head. <laughs> uh, so a Christian apologist is not someone who apologizes for Christianity, but rather it's someone who defends Christianity, someone who defends the faith of Christianity. And why we do that is because of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, when it says, uh, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer. Uh, to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. So we look at that and we say, okay, God wants us to be ready to give someone an answer. W what kind of an answer are we going to give someone? What if somebody came to you and they said, uh, so and so, I, I've been wondering about Jesus and I've been kind of contemplating who he really was. Uh, why do you believe in Jesus? What answer are you going to give them? Why do you believe in Jesus? Because that's what this passage is talking about, saying when somebody comes to you and asks you a reason for the hope, for your belief, what you believe in, what are you going to tell them? And are you going to tell them, well, I just believe. That's all. I have no real reason to believe. I just believe. Right? What are they going to walk away from that conversation feeling? Are they going to feel like, oh, wow, I guess I should become a Christian too because so-and-so believes. <laughs> right? So that's not a very good answer, right? Uh, yes, we do have faith, and that's true. So does scientists, so do atheists, so do everybody. Everyone has faith in something. But the point is, we need to be ready to give them an answer. What if instead of just saying, well, I just believe, we can say something like, well, we know from Scripture that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. We know that he loved me enough to die on the cross. If he loved me enough to do that, surely I should show him some attention and uh, start paying more attention to what he was saying. And then you look at what he was saying, and he was claiming he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. And then you look at that, and you say, well, is that true? Was he really the Messiah? Well, then he started showing signs, these miraculous signs, things that people couldn't do that only God could do. So once he starts showing us these miracles, it starts showing us that he really was who he said he was, because he couldn't do those things on his own. He had to have God in him, or he had to be God uh, to do those things. So we see that those, that verifies that he really was uh, from God. And then we see that he was born of a virgin. Well, mankind can't be born of virgins, right? That doesn't make sense. There has to be something going on between the man and a woman in order for a woman to give birth to somebody. So how was Jesus born of a virgin? Well, obviously God was at work. What's, po what's impossible for us is not impossible for God. So if he was born of a virgin, like the scripture says he was, then certainly God was working in that situation, and he allowed him to be born of a virgin. And then we see that he rose from the dead, perhaps the ultimate sign that he was the Son of God. The religious leaders of the time, they, they claimed Jesus was a blasphemer, and they, he should be put to death because he's blaspheming God. But then we see that God raised him from the dead, obviously verifying that he wasn't a blasphemer. So if God wanted him to be punished for blasphemy, he wouldn't raise him from the dead. So when Jesus claimed he was the Son of God, when Jesus claimed he was one with the God, obviously he was, or else God would not have ro rose him from the dead. Uh, so we can talk about those different evidences, those different reasons why we believe that Jesus was more than just a man. All the miracles he did, all the signs that he did, all the words that he spoke, we can look at that, we can use that as reasons for why we believe what we believe. But if we're just going to tell people, when they ask us, why do you believe that? And we just say, I don't know. Well, what are they supposed to do with that knowledge? They'll just walk away thinking, I'm not going to believe that. That guy is a Christian. He doesn't even know why he believes what he believes. Right? So the Bible says, be ready to give them an answer. And that's what Ravi Zacharias was like. He was an apologist. He gave people answers to the questions that they had about Christianity. Did he always do a perfect job? I don't know. I didn't hear all of his lessons. The ones that I did hear, I thought they were great. And I hear people say sometimes, uh, we don't need apologetics. Right? Apologetics is pointless. God is the one who converts our souls. God is the one who convicts us. The Holy Spirit convicts our hearts and brings us to salvation. It's not through reason, right? They say you can't convince someone into heaven. You can't reason them into heaven. And I completely understand that argument, but it's still a little flawed. <laughs> and I mean, it's true that we can't reason someone into heaven, but sometimes we do have to reason with them. Because so, so often before information can get to someone's heart, it has to go through their head, right? So if information is getting stuck in their head, then it's not going to get to their heart. So when people come to me and they, they ask me, they say, you know, 
uh, how could God have created this? Evolution did this, or evolution uh, was what created the world. Or, and they, they start giving me all this scientific information. Obviously, their issue is a rational issue. They don't believe in God, not because they can't experience him, not because of all this emotional things, but because they can't rationally wrap their mind around there being a God, there being something so great that it created everything. There's rational problems for them. So it's, the knowledge of God is stuck up here and it's not getting to here. So apologists, they try to work on the head so that it can get to the heart. Uh, and that's what apologetics is for, is to explain to people so that it gets past their head so that it can get to their heart. And I, I think that's awesome. And Ravi Zacharias did a great job doing stuff like that in his ministry. Um, and I mean, I, I remember one time, I was, it was Lee Strobel who would also be considered an apologist in the sense that he also tried to defend, or he defended the faith of Christianity. And one of the, one of the books he wrote, and also a documentary that he has, is The Case for Creation. And I remember I preached a sermon when I was just a wee little lad, uh, just barely out of high school. And um, in fact, I'd probably just graduated. And I invited some of my friends from high school to come listen to me preach. It was on a Sunday night or something like that. And I started giving all this information that Lee Strobel gave and just kind of giving my own perspective on stuff and uh, giving rational reasons for why Christians believe what they believe and why God exists and stuff like that. And one of my friends who came, he was kind of agnostic. Uh, he was kind of like, you know, maybe God exists, but I don't really see a reason why he does. Uh, so I'll kind of be open to the idea that maybe he exists, but I don't really think he does exist. Uh, so he was kind of on the fence on that, and that's a very uh, dangerous place to be, on the fence. <laughs> but then after that sermon, after I explained things in an apologetical way, I remember him coming to me afterwards like, Daniel, I, I don't think I'm a Christian yet, but uh, I do believe in God now. I do believe that God does exist. So you see, he had a rational problem. His problem was not... Uh, uh, a, a heart issue. It was a rational issue. The Word of God wasn't getting to his heart because he was stuck in his head uh, trying to reason with, among himself, does God really exist or not? And once it was explained to him that God does exist, the information started going to his heart. And I need to check up on that guy. Uh, I mean, I love that guy. He was a good friend of mine, but I haven't seen him in like five years, or at least since high school. I don't know how long ago that was. Uh, but the point was, a lot of times people are stuck at a rational level, trying to figure out, is there actually reasons to believe in Jesus? And once you get past that rational level, once you get past the head, it'll sink into the heart. I mean, think of the story of the sower and the seed, right? The guy who started throwing seeds everywhere. The, Jesus tells the parable of it, of the sower and the seed. And, you know, he's throwing it everywhere. It's some it's going among thorns, some it's going among the, the path, and some it's going among stony places, and some it's going among uh, soft soil. And we look at that story and we think, if only he just threw it among the good soil, it would have grown and he wouldn't have wasted all those seeds. Well, another way to look at it would be if he was to take up those thorns, right? If he was to pull up the thorns, if he was to pull up the stones, if he was to plow the, the hard ground, the path, and stuff like that, then those seeds would have had a chance to take root and to grow. But because he didn't, because he just started throwing them out randomly, uh, a lot of those seeds never took root because it was stuck at some level, whether it was a heart level or an emotional level, whatever it was, or whether head level, not heart level, head level or heart level, whatever it may have been, they were not ready for the seed. They were not prepared for, their soil was not prepared for the seed, for the message of God, for the gospel. And as a result, a lot of the message got taken away before it could take root. Uh, and I think an apologist, one of their things is to plow the field so that the evangelist can plant the seed. Uh, so Ravi Zacharias is certainly going to be missed. I, I don't remember where this concept came from, but I remember somebody saying, uh, I want to be, make so much of an impact for God that when I die, both heaven and hell rejoice. <laughs> heaven rejoices that, you know, a sinner has come home, and hell rejoices that a servant of God has been taken out of the fight, <laughs> right? And that's certainly the case for Ravi Zacharias. Uh, I mean, he was a sinner just like you and me. He was saved by grace. He became a, a servant of God. As Edmund Burke wrote in the Civil War, or in the American Revolution, these are times which try men's souls. And I just pray that as people of faith, you would help us to recognize the truth of what you tell us in James, that we can count it joy 
when we fall into diverse trials because we know that you're at work. The trying of our faith works patience. So Lord, we thank you that not only have you allowed us in such a time as this, but you're with us in such a time. And I pray that you would equip us to conduct ourselves by your grace, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit in a way that, as Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Help us to exude the peace that passeth understanding while still having grace and sympathy for those who don't know that peace or have not met the source of that peace. May we use such a time as this as Mordecai said of Esther, who knows whether you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. May we use this troubled time, Lord, to be models and instruments and channels of your grace and your love and your kindness to people. We commit our services to you this morning particularly this Memorial Day weekend, help us to recognize the importance of reflection and remembering. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share a brief video with you before the message. We do have uh, nursery this morning for the little ones. If you would like to use them, you are more than welcome to do that. Join us in Proverbs, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. The word Deuteronomy basically means second law. Uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Um, this Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy was, was written and shared with the second generation of Israelites. The generation that had come out, everyone that was over 40 years old who had known Egyptian slavery uh, had died in the wilderness by their own choosing. They had basically told God at Kadesh Barnea 40 years earlier, it were better for us to go back to Egypt or to die in this wilderness than to go forward in, in faith. And God says, okay, I'm gonna, that's a prayer I'm going to answer. So they wandered uh, for 40 years in the wilderness, and then God brought them back to the brink of the promised land and reviewed Deuteronomy is important because it is a summation of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It was important before the children of Israel could go into the next stage of their journey that they look back. We don't want to live in the rearview mirror because that's where accidents come from. But if we don't pause occasionally and look back, we will forget where we've come from. Deuteronomy chapter 8, pick up reading with me in verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Skip down for a moment. Uh, verses uh, 3 through basically 10 is a review of the wilderness and the promise a reminder of the good land that they're about to come in and what's going to happen when they get into the land and they start to prosper. Then verse 11, verse 10. When thou art, hast eaten and are full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgment. Verse 14. Then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Verse 17, and thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. Verse 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. This is Memorial Day weekend. 
And uh, this passage in Deuteronomy is going through my mind and my heart all week. Remember, remember, remember. Memorial Day is a holiday can be traced back to people placing flowers on graves after the Civil War. I remember reading this week of one case where a mother of, uh, I guess you'd say, a Confederate soldier who had died was in the graveyard uh, in, I forget the town, putting flowers on her grave, and she noticed a, a bunch of unmarked grave that she had learned were the bodies of Union soldiers. And then while her and her friends were honoring the memories of their children and their husbands, this lady did something that kind of shocked the other ladies. She went and put flowers on the grave of the uh, unmarked graves of the Union soldiers. And they said, what on earth are you doing that for? And she said, because these soldiers have mothers and wives who are not here and don't even know they're here. So I'm doing this on their behalf. So that's, that's how Memorial Day started. By 1890, almost every state at the time declared what at that time was called Decoration Day to be a, a state holiday. And in 1971, it became a national, the national holiday that we celebrate today. Of course, how do we celebrate it? Technically, it's tomorrow, but how do, how do most people celebrate Memorial Day? You know, I look at my own life and I realize with some level of shame, very few people even th know what Memorial Day is about. Or if they know, they don't even take any, not, not 60 seconds to consciously think, why, am I, why, why is this a day off? And in fact, their days are focused on family and friends and cookouts and parades, perhaps. But the roots of memorials are far more significant. The Bible mentions the word remember or remembering 338 times. Now, I'm not going to go over all 338. I'm going to go over two quickly. The first one is in Genesis 8, 1, and it is interesting. In Genesis 8, 1, God had just judged the earth. Genesis 6 says, It came to pass that the thoughts of men's heart were only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he made man. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God gave Noah directions. God gave the humanity 120 years to get their act straight. God calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. So while he was building the ark, a huge illustration, he preached and nobody listened except his own children and their wives. And then it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And then Genesis 8, 1, then the Lord remembered Noah. And the word remembered here in the Hebrew is zakar, and it means to remember or mark. Many of us remember maybe uh, the old-timey way of tying a little thread on your finger to remind you of something. Are, are you forgetful? I, I'm incredibly forgetful, and I know as we all get older, we all are a little bit concerned about dementia and Alzheimer's, and, and frankly, our brains qu aren't quite as sharp. My brain is not quite as sharp as it used to be. And we find ourselves walking into a room and forgetting what we're doing there. Uh, and it is the curse of men that we, for, that we forget. But God, God doesn't forget. And in fact, he marked, he marked Noah. The last reference is somewhat similar to the first reference. It's found in Revelation chapter 18. It's found at the conclusion of the great tribulation period where just like Noah's day, God is judging the earth. And God, before the final judgment comes down, the final bold judgments come out, God sends an angel and says, come out of her. Babylon is the capital, symbolic capital of the Antichrist kingdom. I don't know exactly where it's going to be. Lots of speculation about that. But God, Babylon is symbolic of the devil's control over the world. And God says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and the Lord hath remembered. In this word, it's, uh, the New Testament is written in Greek, and God is mindful of what's going on on earth. And the chapter goes on to say, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils. By thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found uh, the blood of the saints. So the first time God remembers is in the, in the middle of judgment. It's like what Jeremiah said in Lamentations. In wrath, remember mercy. In the middle of judgment of the Noah's day, he remembered Noah. In the middle of judgment of the tribulation period, he's remembering his people and said, come on out of her because I don't want you to either get caught up in her sins or in the judgment. Now the reality is we tend to be become forgetful people. Many of you have heard this quote. You may not know where it came from. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. God knew of the danger of forgetfulness. 
So instead of telling his people to tie, actually, instead of telling his people to tie little threads on their fingers to remind them, do you remember what God did tell them to put on their bodies? Phylacteries. Tie them about thine, put them upon, at the forefront of your head. You see uh, devout Jews, you'll see a little box wrapped up in their head and on your right hand. And, and inside those phylacteries are scriptures, particularly, mostly the Jew of Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and might. And these words which I command thee, they say, shall be in your heart. Teach them to your children. Why? Because we have a tendency of forgetting. The word memorial is found 46 times in Scripture, and it's zekar. It means a memento. It comes from zakar, which means to mark, like God marked Noah, to remember. The Bible is filled with memorials, significant events that God challenged his people, mark this event, build an altar, mark it in some tangible way. Genesis 22 is a significant time. God told Abraham, after waiting for probably 30 or 40 years for, for the promised son, Isaac was born, and then when Isaac was 13, God told Abraham, take him to Mount, and I will show you, of, which we know as Mount Moriah or Mount Calvary now, and offer him as a sacrifice. And Abraham went there to do that. Him and Isaac are walking up the mountain with the fire and with the wood, and Isaac said, Father, we, I have the, we see the fire, and the, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham thought he was going to sacrifice his son, but God, Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a, a lamb for the sacrifice. And when he got up there, instead of sacrificing Isaac, he saw a ram, a male lamb, a ram caught in the thicket by the horns, and he sacrificed that. And the Bible says, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will see to it, the Lord will provide. In this very difficult time where people around our country and frankly around our world are losing their jobs and wondering how are we going to survive and of course the government is trying to step in to fill that role we as people of faith need to remember this altar 4,000 years ago God is Jehovah Jireh he knows how to take care of his people another memento is a little before this event in chapter 19 God had judged Sodom and Gomorrah God, Lot and his family were there God sent an angel to deliver Lot and his family and warn them Flee because I'm going to rain fire and brimstone out, down out of this place. Don't look back. Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. You said, what kind of memorial is this? It's a memorial Jesus himself said, remember Lot's wife. Don't lose sight of the danger of getting so wrapped up in the world. John says, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, it's from the world and the world will pass away. Jesus said, don't forget Lot's wife. And then another memorial, which uh, was Joshua, they came to the border at the conclusion of Deuteronomy. Then Joshua took over. Moses died. Joshua was challenged to lead the people of Israel to the promised land. They didn't have to cross the Red Sea, but they had to cross the Jordan River in the springtime when it was overflowed the banks. And God says, the moment that the priest's feet touch the water, I will part it. They, unlike a generation ago where God parted the Red Sea all night and then it was already dry for them to walk through, God says, I'm not going to do that this time. You're going to have to have the faith to step out. And the moment the priest's feet hit the water, it parted, and the people of Israel walked through on dry land. And God says, now take one man from every one of the 12 tribes, take a stone and put it in the middle of the Jordan River. And then take a stone that you find in the Jordan River, and this is what they did with it. They piled those 12 stones in Gilgal. And when they were asked why, God says, when your children shall ask your fathers in time to pan, what, what's the point of these stones? Then you will let your children know this is where Israel crossed the Jordan River, that all the people of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. The point of memorials is they survive after the memory or the event don't survive. And, and the memorial pricks our memory, and if we've been taught accurately, which is a big danger in our country about the significance of our history, it tends to remind us, and we can hopefully learn the lessons. Another example of this is a stone the Bible calls Ebenezer, where Israel had been defeated by the Philistine armies and so, to such a degree that in, in the days uh, of uh, uh, Eli the high priest, the priests were corrupt, and, 
and they didn't, they, they, the armies of uh, the Philistines were coming and they said, let's go grab the Ark of the Covenant. It will save us. And it didn't save them. And they lost the Ark of the Covenant and the priest, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed and it was a terrible battle. Well, fast forward the clock a, a couple of years later and now the Philistines are coming back and they come to Samuel, who is now the priest and the prophet, and said, please pray for us. And, and Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. In other words, I don't want you to forget that God has been with us in the past when we're honoring and trusting him. He will be with us in the future. You know, may I challenge you to build some altar somewhere in some way to remind yourself of the truth of all the way my Savior leads me. Our nation has done this. This is the uh, Pilgrim Memorial. Technically, it's a memorial to our forefathers in Plymouth, Massachusetts, honoring the values, four sides to it. It's the biggest granite structure, freestanding granite structure in, in America, honoring uh, the law in education and uh, morality and liberty. Mount Rushmore, some of you have been to, uh, honoring four significant great presidents. I've been to Washington, D.C., a dozen or more times, and every time I go, I try to visit these key memorials because they, uh, they overwhelm me with memories. Michael went with me, I think, the last time, and he said it was one of the greatest trips of his life. This is the Jefferson Memorial, and of course the Washington Memorial, and the Lincoln Memorial, and they're all awe-inspiring, but their purpose is not the architecture, their purpose, because in, in each of these are carved significant statements of the, the man that they're memorializing. They're not really memorializing the man as much as the ideas that these men stood for. Now there are memorials in our country that are quite unusual. I, I've shared with you, this is a memorial to the boll weevil in Enterprise, Alabama. It's been a couple of years since I shared that story. But uh, back in the early 1900s, the, the Alabama was a cotton industry and they depended on cotton and the boll weevil, boll weevil migrated. It, he was maybe the first illegal immigrant and it, it, it migrated from Mexico and destroyed the cro cotton crops, and destroyed their livelihood. And, and they kept trying to plant cotton and figure out how do we get rid of this boll weevil. And then someone, it may have been George Washington Carver's, inspired by George Washington Carver, said maybe, maybe it's time to look at something other than cotton. Well, we know cotton, that's all we know. So they decided, I think it was peanuts at that time, I'm not sure what the crop was, but they decided to change and, uh, and begin to put their energy into a crop that the boll weevil wasn't interested in, and they prospered. I don't know if you can read this, but this is the monument. December 2nd, 1919, in profound appreciation for the boll weevil and what it has done to herald the prosperity, this monument was erected by the citizens of Enterprise County, Alabama. Many monuments are supremely sad. Linda and I, a number of years ago, had the privilege of visiting to Cal, uh, one of the Nazi concentration camps, and we stood there where they got off of the train, and we stood there and walked through the gas chambers and the ovens, and it, it, just an overwhelming sadness. And uh, why, why is Auschwitz and Dachau, why do they still have museums there? What's the point? Isn't it, isn't it true that many times we want to erase the negative parts of our history? We don't want to acknowledge even our personal history, but we need to remember where we've come from. Because remember what Santayana said, he that forgets the past is, is destined to repeat it. First time, not the first time, uh, first time I visited the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., I was just overwhelmed. I took my family and the pictures and the actual footage, and they, they always give you a name and a little information, and so you can, this is who you are a name of one of the Holocaust people. And, and as you're walking through this, try to put yourself in the position of this person. And you go through that and you're just shocked by the atrocities. And then the last thing you see when you walk out is this. It's the Holocaust memorial flame. I'm going to put the scripture up there so you can read it. This is the last thing you see before you walk out of the Holocaust Museum after you've been exposed to the cruelty and the ignorance and the evil that men can do to one another and justify. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. Even in our generation we've had world leaders who tried to deny the Holocaust. It's easy to forget. 
This is a Revolutionary War memorial, and there are many all over the country, but this is the one in Washington, D.C. And I don't know if you can read this. Freedom is a light for which many have died in darkness. In, in unmarked graves within this square lie thousands of unknown soldiers of Washington's army who died of wounds and sickness during the Revolutionary War. The independence and liberty you possess are the work of joint councils and joint efforts of common dangers, sufferings, and success. Washington's Farewell Address, 1796. 25,000 American patriots died in the Revolutionary War. Arlington National Cemetery, just outside of Washington, D.C., houses over 400 graves of soldiers who have died in various wars. I visited Arlington probably half a dozen times, and <laughs> whenever I travel, I, I want to see as much as I can see, so I I I'm in, in fifth gear the whole time. And I ignored the, the mansion on the hilltop for the first five or six visits. And one year I decided to slow down. Maybe I'm just getting older. And I visited that mansion and found out it was the birthplace of Robert E. Lee. And I thought, that was strange. So I researched the story and actually George Washington's adopted son built the house and Robert E. Lee and George Washington were relatives of sorts. And in 18, uh, 1861, Robert E. Lee moved and accepted the uh, Commit, resigned from the Union, from the American Army, and became uh, aligned with the Confederates. And uh, basically, in 18, you can research them, I think it's 1862, a, a spiteful Congress passed a law that we're going to tax, not everybody, but we're going to tax the properties of Confederates. So they put a tax on Robert E. Lee's mansion, and then they passed a law saying he had to come and pay for it in person. <laughs> you see where this is going? Of course, he didn't. His wife had to flee the, flee the place, and uh, then they confiscated it. They put it on the auction bid, and, and the government, Union government, American government, bought it for, 20, I think, $25,000. Uh, and it became a blight. And then probably as an act of spite, a quartermaster general of the Union Army decided to take the property and use it to bury dead soldiers. Robert E. Lee never returned to the place. His wife returned once and left in tears. Their son, after the war, uh, sued the government, and according to this, uh, and eventually it went through many, many decades of uh, litigation. Eventually, the Supreme Court acknowledged the government confiscated that land illegally, and they had to pay him back. But an interesting story. But some 620,000 American soldiers died during this war. Largest death toll of any war. Almost twice the total death to toll of American lives. And that's infighting. There's a powerful, story, <laughs> powerful lesson there that I don't have time to develop. The mall between the Lincoln Memorial and the, and the Congress and the Washington Memorial is right in the... In the if I'm facing uh, the uh, Congress... The Washington Memorial's in the middle. To my right, about a mile that way, is the White House. To my left, to my right, about a mile that way, is the Jefferson Memorial. So the major memorials on the Capitol Mall form a cross. And, a world, and in between, around these malls, are the war memorials. World War I memorial, 116,516 soldiers died. World War II memorial. I, I don't know if my thing, right here you can see it's an oval of stars, and these are all of the different states uh, and, and the soldiers, the, the number of men and women that they, that they sent there. And this is the wall called the Price of Freedom. You can't read this, but it basically says every one of these stars symbolizes the death of 100 American soldiers. 405,399 American soldiers died in World War II. Korean War Memorial is an interesting memorial. There's a little building, but as you walk them all, you see these statues of men just walking in different positions. And on the wall uh, near the men is a statement, freedom is not free. And there's this uh, plaque on the, on the ground. Our nation honors her sons and daughters who answered the call to defend a country they never knew and a people they never met. 36,516 American soldiers and nurses, female and male, died as a result of that almost halfway around the world. 
the Vietnam Memorial, the newest of the memorials, war memorials. There's plans for the Afghan and Iraqi war memorial. When I was there the last time, they had a temporary display uh, with faces and backgrounds of many of the soldiers. But 58,209 died in Vietnam. Afghanistan, 2440. 20,000, over 20,000 wounded. Iraqi, 4,424 lives lost, 30, almost 32,000 wounded in action. Here's a, here's a list of the wars, and basically you add them together, and America has given 1.3 million of her sons and daughters in wars. Memorial Day is, this is what Memorial Day in America is supposed to be about. Just remember these were sons, these were daughters, these were husbands, these were wives, these were grandchildren. Almost more than half of them died fighting in another country. They didn't die fighting for their own country. They died fighting for the liberty of another country. Jesus said in John 15, greater love hath no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. But I want to remind you of that Korean War Memorial. Our nation honors her sons and daughters who answered the call to defend a country they never knew and a people they never met. If greater love hath no man than this and to lay down his life for a friend, what does it mean? How do you measure? How do you measure the dedication where someone is willing to die for a stranger? Someone they don't know. So today, and I hope tomorrow, you'll spend some time honoring this. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier uh, is also in Arlington National uh, Cemetery. You know, I've been to Arlington many times. I think the first son that I took alone was Chris. And um, I've been to Arlington a couple of times before that, but with just me and Chris walking, and now I have, at the time, Chris was 19 years old. And I have my 19-year-old son with me, and we're walking through Arlington. And, and it hit me completely different than it ever hit me before. Why? Because you look at the ages of most of the people on those tombstones. They're 18, 19, 20, 21. And though I had walked it before, and it's a beautiful place, and, and I love history, it hit me different when I was able to personalize it. And I, I saw my son. If, if he were in one of those wars, he probably would have been uh, forced into military or may have chosen the military, and it may have been his grave. And it's easy to forget the significance of these huge numbers. But when I began to understand, these are somebody's sons. They could be and maybe someday my son. It, it had a significantly different impact. Now I want to close my message with a, with a I guess a, a little bit of a history lesson and make a biblical application to it. Yale history professor David Blight was researching for a book and he went to the Harvard uh, archives, and in the Harvard archives he was digging and he found a box that belonged to an old Union soldier. And in that box he found some data that he had never heard. And he began to research really what was the first Memorial Day service, the first decoration day that occurred. And it was basically occurred, it was conducted by freed slaves in Charleston, South Carolina. Let me tell you the story briefly. During the war, and by the way, as I mentioned in our own crisis, there are good people who have different opinions. We sang that song, I, I researched that song that Mark sang, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Apparently Johnny Cash uh, sang it, and in some of his concerts he said, it was interesting that both sides claimed this song. That's not historically true, it was definitely a union song. But both sides claimed the principle. God's on our side. We're fighting for God. Isn't it amazing how we can rationalize what we're doing? And frankly, uh, there was atrocities committed on both sides of that issue, as there are atrocities committed on both sides of the political aisles, because men are men, women are women, and the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And without accountability, tyranny will rule in the human heart. But during the war, Char they ran out of room in the prisons in Charleston, so they converted what was once a very posh racetrack and jockey club called the Washington Racetrack and Jockey Club uh, to a prison camp. And they basically interred the prisoners in tents outside on the track for Union soldiers. 
During that time, because of the conditions and because of the malnutrition, because of the exposure to the elements, 260 of those soldiers died from disease and exposure, and they were buried in mass graves. Just a, We think of Hitler in his mass graves. Well, this is the, this, these are Americans in their mass graves. We don't know these people. We don't care about these people. We don't want to take the time to honor them. We're just going to dig a hole and dump their bodies, and that's what happened. So there's a mound at this prison camp. When Charleston fell to the Union uh, Army in February 17, 1865, of course, the military in Charleston, and many of the people fled, fearing what was going to happen, of course. Leaving their slaves there, thousands and thousands of slaves, were abandoned by the people that quote-unquote owned them. One of the first things those slaves did is they got together and they recognized, because it was no secret what was going on in that prison camp, they recognized what had happened, so they dug the bodies up and gave each body a proper Christian burial. They put a big whitewashed fence there with the words inscribed, these are the martyrs of the race course, and that's a picture of the graveyard that they built. This is an old article May 18th 1867 from the Harper's Weekly acknowledging this the martyrs of the race course Union prisoner cemetery of Charleston South Carolina on May 1st this is just a two months after the the slaves were technically freed because their masters ran off 10,000 people according to the New York Tribune of the Charleston Courier 10,000 people most of them freed black people some of them were missionaries who were ministering to the freed black people. They staged a parade around the uh, racetrack that had ho uh, held the p prisoners. Black children, according to the record, 3,000 black children carried bouquets of flowers and sang and while black ministers recited Bible verses. You say, well, preacher, what's the significance of this? I think it's significant that the very first Memorial Day service was conducted by freed slaves. The people who more than any, and this is a plaque, which I don't know if you can read. I'll put a copy in your notes, uh, marking this location. The significance uh, is, is who would be most grateful, who would be most impacted by the sacrificial death than the people who were freed as a result of that death. Some 1.3 million Americans gave their lives fighting for our American values over our last 243 years since we became a nation. We should remember them. Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address, if you go to the Lincoln Memorial, the Gettysburg Address is etched in the walls. And he talked about honoring those who gave the last full measure of devotion. What's another word for devotion? Love. Love for what? Well, love for their freedom. Love for their country. People who had enjoyed freedom we're, we're fighting on behalf of those who were not enjoying freedom or not even understanding or even recognizing freedom. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Of the 1.3 million Americans that gave their lives for fighting for freedom, over 50 million, in other words, they died for values in my lifetime, in the lifetime of most of yours. I just want you to understand the numbers. 1.3 million since, since the Revolutionary War. 1.3 million People have given their lives for freedom and for American values. In the last less than 50 years, 50 million unborn children have given their lives. Not because of American values, but because we have forgotten our American values. We have bowed the knee to the God of expediency, profit, during this crisis, abortion clinics have been considered uh, necessary, mandatory. You probably heard that the uh, Planned Parenthood illegally applied for and received millions of dollars of that small business loan paycheck program, even though they get millions of dollars from American taxpayers every year. Values is what I'm talking about. We forget our values. Isn't that what God warned the children of Israel about in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8? It's easy to remember me, God was saying, when I'm feeding you every day and when I'm taking care of you miraculously, 
but you're about to go into a land that I've prepared for you and you're going to live in houses you didn't build and you're going to be eaten from trees and orchards you didn't plant and you're going to get wealthy and you're going to prosper. It was interesting, Abraham Lincoln referenced this in 1863 when he called for a national day of fasting and prayer and repentance for America. And he said, and this is pretty close to a quote, but you can certainly look it up. America has been blessed and prospered like no nation in the world, but we have become vain in our prosperity and we have assumed that our prosperity was through some ingenuity or excellence of our own and we have forgotten God. We have forgotten God. Here we are 150 years later in another crisis and maybe another opportunity to remember. The first to celebrate Memorial Day were freed slaves who had the, the opportunity and the privilege and may I say the responsibility to honor those who died to give them freedom. We should honor those of us who once were slaves. Should honor the death, the life, the values of the one who gave his life to purchase our freedom. Romans chapter six says, you were all the servants of sin. Slaves, the word servant is dulio, slaves. But you've obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which is delivered unto you the gospel, the good news. Being made free from sin, what should we do? You became the servants of righteousness. Jesus' sacrifice should motivate us, not just to appreciate our freedom and certainly to honor him, but to become servants of righteousness. Second Corinthians chapter five, Paul verse 10 says, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things which we've done in our bodies while we live, whether they're good or evil, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, every one of us is gonna stand before that judgment seat someday. But, but he goes on to say, but it's not just about terror. It's about remembering the love of Christ that motivated him to sacrifice himself on our behalf. The love of Christ is the one that constrains us because we thus judge, we reason this way, that if he, one, he died for all, then, then we were as good as dead, but he died for us that we which live should not live for ourselves, but for him which died for them and rose again. That chapter goes on to say now, because of, we were bond slaves, now we're servants of Christ, now we represent him, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Some of the conflict, and, and I hesitate to bring this up because I'm not versed and I don't remember all the names, but one of, one of the many complexities of what's gone on in our own last couple of years in our national level is many of the people who were appointed by the last administration President Trump continued to allow to serve. Why would he do such a crazy thing? Because he assumed they were patriots. He assumed that they had the values of America at heart. And much of what has happened, whether it's in the State Department or some of the ambassadors, much of what has happened is because he had people that he allowed to stay in their jobs because he could have done what President Obama did and pretty much fire them all and put his own people in. He didn't. I think a, a, probably a naive act, <laughs> but an act of generosity, an act of whatever you want to call it, Americanism. And yet they did not represent his positions. And in fact, as we're learning in the last couple of weeks, many of them actively worked against him. Now I want to ask you, the Bible says we're, we're Christ's ambassadors. Are we working for his principles and his values? Or is it possible that we might be working against them? And that's what Paul was saying. You are, an, not, not you can become, you are an ambassador. You represent him. So be reconciled to God. The word reconciled, ketelasso, it means be changed mutually. Let God work with your spirit to begin to change your attitude, change your perspective. Second Corinthians 3.18, it says, when, when we with an open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord through his word, we're changed. Freedom is not free. 1.3 million people paid for our freedom and the freedom of other nations around the world who have, to some degree at least, enjoyed more freedom because of the people who sacrificed. So let's spend some time honoring the memory of the values. The men, the women, they're gone, they're in eternity, they're beyond the reach 
Frankly, they're beyond the reach of our gratitude or our prayers. Their fate is sealed as your fate will be sealed when you breathe your last breath. But we can honor the memory and the values that motivated them, that motivated them to be willing to make such a sacrifice. But for those of us who are people of faith, let's not forget that we, like those slaves in 1865 in Charleston, we were freed because someone chose to die for us. You know, I just close with that verse, you are ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.20. The last verse in that chapter, verse 21, says, for God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He was innocent that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Right after talking about we're ambassadors, sandwiched between the love of Christ constraints because he died for us and that he became sin for us is be reconciled to God. If you're not reconciled to God, if you don't know him as your savior and if you're not following him and honoring him as your Lord, then I would challenge you with the same challenge that Paul challenged. I pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to gather. And I know that's a, that's a privilege that is becoming increasingly